book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. Now, at the end of every year, I kind of start into a process of just asking God, praying about, asking for discernment of where we're headed for as a church, uh, give an understanding of what we should be doing uh, concerning different ministries, different outreaches, different opportunities with discipleship, uh, and especially planning like sermon series, a uh, series that will build, that will help us to grow in faith, sermons that will be of a discipleship nature. Uh, what is it that we need to hear from God? And just like I do every year, again, I, I went through that process and God, what is it that you would have us to see? What do we need to focus our attention upon? What are you showing us in this time and in uh, this moment? And at times it, it seems as if, in fact, I know that God at times gives very clear direction. Um, last year, as we started off the year talking about who's your one, and we had that big one here on the platform, that it was just this thing that God is saying, okay, we have to understand that we have a circle of influence. We have people, whether it's friends, family members, coworkers, classmates, that only we have this close connection to, and God is calling us to intersect into their lives and to show them the love of Christ. Who is that person? And man, as we continued to look and focus on that, and as people continually wrote names upon this one, as that, that one just became covered in names of people that God had laid upon our heart and burdened us to pray for, it was crystal clear that God is saying, we must point people to Jesus. And so I hope that throughout this, this last year, that that did become a passion of yours, that you took that initiative. I heard so many interesting stories about how God took that and how you had opportunities to be able to share the good news of Jesus with others. And that doesn't just end because we turned the calendar year to 2022, okay? So last year, yeah, that's crystal clear. At other times, when I ask God and say, God, where would, what, are we, what are we needing to focus on? What are we needing to look at? Sometimes it's not as clear as, okay, this is the topic, this is the subject matter, this is where you need to head as a, a, a church. But at times it's just a principle, a principle that needs to be addressed, something that needs to be looked at. Well, this case last year, I really felt God impressing upon my heart the need to be able to help us as a whole church body to understand the best process and the best ways in which to truly discern the will of God. I've been in, right in the pastor's corner about the will of God for the last four weeks. And so how do we discern the will of God? And what it boils down to is an understanding of his word, communication to him through prayer, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, and then relying upon uh, the counsel of others. Understanding that we have a church family, that we have wisdom and knowledge that God has given to us that we are to draw from. But everything focuses back upon what God has already said in his word. And so one of the principles that we have to learn as individuals and as a church is how to draw out of the Word of God that information that I need for my daily life. Okay? And the way in which we do that is, is really pretty simple. You take the Bible, you open the Bible, and you read the Bible, right? Okay, that's it. Take the Bible, open the Bible, read the Bible. But here's the deal. A lot of times we do a sermon series and we do a, a topical sermon series. And sometimes that's really, really necessary. We get that. I get that. But it's not most of the time that you say, okay, God, I'm, I, I'm, I'm needing to learn about discernment. And so you, you, you look up every verse about discernment and then you cross-reference and then you take notes about every verse and you go back and forth to learn about discernment. That's not the normal way that we approach uh, studying the Bible or reading. Normally you open it up and either you start the book of Genesis or maybe you start in the book of Matthew or you start somewhere else and you say, hey, I think God's impressing on my heart to read this book of the Bible. And you start in chapter 1, verse 1, and you read till you get to the end. Okay, And that is the natural way, the natural understanding of the way in which we, we, we read books and the way in which we read the Bible. Now we did that last summer. We went through the book of Judges. Uh, we looked at, uh, at all of these different large-scale themes, but in a chronological way, starting in the beginning, reading through the book of Judges. Well, what God has kind of done, uh, at least for me, is laying upon my heart say the necessity to look at a book of the Bible, figure out how we can draw out that truth, and then make that practical application. And so this year, we're going to be doing that a little bit more rather than just throughout the summer. That's kind of been something that I had always done throughout the summer, 8, 10 weeks, 12 weeks study, uh, looking at different things. But this year, you're going to be getting uh, some different studies of, of different books. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with the topical messages, topical sermon series, uh, based upon those things that we need to, to address. Um, it's just simply not the way that we normally read the Bible. We don't normally pray and ask God uh, about a certain subject matter and then walk, work through the Bible finding out the answers. And so what we're doing with this series is we're going to be looking at an Old Testament book, and it's the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. 
But as we read Malachi, there is one really central theme that really stands out here that I'm going to keep drawing our attention back to because it becomes the practical application side of our study of this book. And that practical application side, that point of emphasis, is loving the things that God loves. Okay? That God wants us to love the things that he loves. Okay? If we are fashioned and created in the image of God, as we talked about last week, as we had the Sanctity of Life Sunday, understanding that every single person is crafted and created in the image of God, bearing the image of God, okay, that we are also to be imitators of Christ, so much that, that goes into this, Okay, that if God loves something, he also is instructing us to love that same thing. And so out, throughout the, the book of Malachi, the prophet Malachi is going to reveal God's heart, and he's going to reveal God's love to his people, showing them that which he loves. Now at times, this is going to be a tough love. As you read through Malachi, God is going to, at times, be very tough on the people. We'll address why. We'll talk about the historical reasons. And we'll talk about why sometimes God has to be tough on us, right? Why sometimes we're bullheaded. Why sometimes it has to get drilled into us okay? because of our own stubbornness, our own pride, our own sinfulness, our own whatever. Okay? We'll deal with that. But at times, it is that tough love that has to be shown. But it's clearly love. We're going to see that. And again, what God loves, we too should love. And we are instructed to do so. So let me go ahead and give you a preliminary breakdown of where we're headed. If you want to read uh, ahead during the week, and if you want to, to kind of look at some things that we're going to be addressing in the coming weeks, go ahead and do so. And so if you want to kind of just jot down where we're headed, uh, that would be a good idea. Today I'm going to give you a little bit of background uh, into the book of Malachi, and then we're going to look at the first five verses. And so we're going to talk about some necessary context, and then we'll look at Malachi 1, 1 through 5. Next week we're going to be finishing off chapter 1, we'll look at verses 6 through 14. That's week number two. Week three, we're going to attempt to tackle all of chapter two, looking at verses one through 17. In week four, we're going to look at Malachi three, one through 15. That's the bulk of chapter three, we're leaving off a few verses there. And then in our final week, we'll finish off the last few verses of chapter three, and then read through the end of Malachi, which is Malachi chapter four, verse six. The last chapter is pretty short. So four chapters, five weeks, one very interesting book of the Bible. If you've never read Malachi, I think you're going to come away from this going, wow, okay, this is extremely significant, especially significant in the placement of the book. And we're going to talk about that today. Now, before we read that main text, let me give you the background that we're going to need as we study this Old Testament book. Again, it is the last book of the Old Testament and is named for the author of the book, the prophet Malachi. In Hebrew, that name comes from a word meaning messenger. So Malachi's name literally means messenger. And it points to his role as a prophet of the Lord, delivering God's message to God's people. And so he is God's uh, mouthpiece, speaking to uh, the nation of Israel. Malachi doesn't really give us a lot of an identifying information concerning himself. Uh, we don't have a father's name. Uh, we really don't even have a current leader of Israel. Um, but based on the content of the book, it is clear that Malachi delivers his message delivers these prophetic words and delivers uh, the message of God to a Judean audience who is familiar with worship in the temple of Jerusalem. And so that does put us in a, in a contextual place, in a timeline that we can determine several things from. The situation was the people of Judah had turned away from the true worship of the Lord, and they're needing to once again see God for who he truly was. And so this is kind of that cyclical thing. Where the nation of Israel would be drawn close to the Lord, then they would come away from him, and then they'd come back to him, and they'd come away from him, and they'd go in this circle. They're in this place now where they've gone far, far away from the Lord. Kind of like the same context of the book of Judges that we studied uh, this last summer. And so this is where the people are. They need to see God for who he truly is. They need to understand what it is God expects of them. They need to see the love of God. And they're going to through the prophet uh, Malachi. The book of Malachi, it gives us a few clues as to what is happening historically. In Malachi 1.8, the prophet used the Persian word for governor, which that tells you quite a bit, actually, if you're a historian. Uh, historians tell us that this has to be somewhere within the time period of 538 to 333 BC. This is when the Persian Empire ruled the Promised Land. And so that is the only time frame when that could have fallen because he uses the Persian word uh, for the governor. So there's a window of about 200 years there. Uh, but the time of the writing of Malachi can be narrowed down even more uh, as it corresponds with the writings of Nehemiah. 
as he's writing about what is happening. And if you were to parallel that to Nehemiah, you see that they are contemporaries and likely that Malachi is following Nehemiah, that, uh, that the people have returned, that the city is being rebuilt. If you've read through Nehemiah, you kind of understand the rebuilding of, of the walls, the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. And so we see that they are likely contemporaries, which is going to put us in the early 400s uh, B.C. So what does that background information mean for us today? I mean, is, is it just history? Okay. Is it just information that you kind of file away and then forget tomorrow? Okay. Well, for one, it helps us to understand the prevailing mindset of the people uh, based off of what they're experiencing historically. So if you're an oppressed people, if you have returned from uh, captivity of, of, another, of another country, another culture, the Babylonians, um, you're, you're, you're discouraged, you're depressed, but you've seen God doing some things, you see the rebuilding of the walls of the city, you kind of get an idea of what they're thinking, right? And that's really important, because to understand the mindset of the people to whom are being written helps us to understand the tone and the nature of why God's writing, right? And so when we take it, we've got to understand that same tone. We've got to understand why God would be writing to the people in this fashion in this specific given time, Right? God's going to deal with people in different ways according to their needs because he's loving, gracious, and kind. He knows what I need when I need it. When I need correction, God corrects me. When I need encouragement, he encourages me. When I need direction, he leads me. And so it's going to be different things at different places and times. So historically, that really helps us to understand the mindset. There's been over a thousand years since the time of Abraham. So that also tells us that the people of Israel have seen patterns They have seen what it means to be obedient to God, and they have learned what it means to be disobedient to God. The the Jewish culture would pass down from generation to generation oral history. Okay, they would pass down the traditions and everything to their children, and their children would pass it down. It was extremely important. That's why you have all of the genealogies in the Old Testament from one generation to the next to the next to the next. Family history and family lineage was so important. And so the rewards of God and the discipline of God, all of those things would have been known by all these people today. They would have known what it means to be obedient, and they would have known the cost of disobedience. That's simply the way it is, because that was their culture. And so this period, these people have the advantage of looking backward, seeing faithfulness, and looking backward and seeing consequences of disobedience. But the problem is this. Even with all that perspective, the book of Malachi teaches us that they still strayed away from the Lord and his will for their lives. But God didn't give up on them. And to me, this is where it gets really encouraging. Because I know I mess up. Do you ever mess up? (laughs) Do you ever fall short of what God's expectations really are? Every day. I'm talking about me. Every day. In some way, shape, or form, I fall short of God's expectation for my life every single day. Now, that can cause one of two things in me. And cause me to despair and be depressed and say, man, I could never serve God. There's, there's, just, there's no hope because I'm a failure, right? God, I just mess up too much. And so just pack it up, pack it in, say, God, thanks for the ride, I'm done. Okay? Or I can say, God, you're gracious, you're kind, you're teaching me. Help me to be more faithful. Help me to draw closer to you. Help me to love you more. Help me not to make that same mistake twice. Help me to be aware of what you're doing in my life. I can go forward. So I either go backward or I go forward. There's really no static. There's really no just staying where you are. There's really no status quo. You're either growing in your faith or you're going backwards. And that's the same thing with the nation of Israel. And you know, even though they're going backwards here, God didn't give up on them. There's going to be consequences. There's going to be some judgment upon the nation because God wanted for the people to return to him. His way is always the best way. I I say this quite a bit, right? That God's way is always the best way. Why are we so stubborn that we try and and do an end around of God's plan? Why do we circumvent that which is best and settle for that which is second best, which is our own way? God's way is always the best way. He wants what was best for his people. And again, same is true for us today as well. God knows what's best for us. He wants what's best for his children. And if that requires some level of correction as well, he's going to do it. And it's not because he doesn't care for us. It's because he does. Now, I've got three kids. Kids are growing up, okay? And, but there was times that we had to have correction time in our house. 
whether it is the removal of privileges, whether it's other forms of correction. Yeah, correction. Doesn't seem fun, but we do it because we care. God's the same way. He corrects us. He changes our course because he cares. And that's what he's going to be doing with the nation of Israel. Now, with the historical account of what we're going to be reading over the next five weeks, Malachi came along at a time when the people were struggling to believe that God loved them. Okay? The people were truly struggling to believe that God could love them and that he really did. All right, we are going to see that this morning. We're going to see it right from the very second verse of the book of Malachi. The people of Israel literally doubting the love of God. Now, they were focusing on a few things. They were focusing on their unfortunate circumstances, and they had some, right? They had some reason to be, to be down, okay? They were, at the same time, though, refusing to account for their own actions, their own sinful actions at that. They looked around them and it's like, oh, woe is me, but they didn't account for what they were actually doing. And so what God does is that he points the finger right back at them and through Malachi told them where they had fallen short of their covenant with him. If they hoped to see changes, they needed to take responsibility for their own actions and serve God faithfully, according to his way, the way that was ultimately best for them. We talked about that in, in our discipleship group that we had back here this morning. God has given us his word, he's given us instructions so that we would follow his will his way, not that he would come alongside of us. Okay? Again, it holds true, okay? whether it's 2,000 years ago or whether it's today. If we hope to see change in our lives, we must take responsibility for our own actions and faithfully serve the Lord. Keep this thought in mind as we get into our study this morning. If we hope to see change in our lives, we must take responsibility for our own actions and faithfully serve the Lord. Okay? That is within my power. Okay? I can't blame it on my circumstances. I can't blame it on anybody else. I can't blame it on my situation I find myself in. I take responsibility. If you haven't already done so, go ahead and open your Bibles. Bible apps with me this morning, the book of Malachi. Again, it's the final book of the Old Testament, so if you want to find the book of Matthew and go backward, you're going to find the book of Malachi. I'm going to be reading the first five verses, so follow along with me as we start into chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever." Your eyes shall see, and you shall say, the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. All right, and that's where we're going to stop today. We're going to break it down a little bit. We're going to see a couple of really, really important truths here. And right from the beginning, though, we see that there is great weight and heaviness to the words that are being spoken. All right, and this is going to pertain to the entire book of Malachi. When it opens with the phrase, the burden of the word of the Lord. Right? A burden is a weight or a heaviness. Sometimes in Christianese, we talk about, I feel burdened, I have this burden. Right? And, and it's this, this heaviness of heart, this sense of, of what I should be or should not be doing. And so we use that term sometimes, burden. Now, an, an unbeliever, somebody who's not a Christian, they might not kind of understand that context. Right? But when the Bible opens uh, the book of Malachi with that phrase, the burden of the word of the Lord, it's talking about the heaviness, that these are significant words. They are not idle words, and so what God is saying through the prophet Malachi are going to be weighty. They're going to be heavy. There's no flippancy here. It is just truth from the heart of God, right? Unadulterated truth. But again, some of these truths are going to be hard truths for the nation of Israel. It's going to be hard for them to swallow as they find themselves in conditions that are definitely less than favorable for them. What's happened is they've returned from exile in the land of Babylon, but it's only a small portion of the nation. Again, this is paralleling what has happened with Nehemiah. Not a lot of people have returned. Some have. They now find themselves, though, in a position of poverty, famine, continuing threats from neighboring nations. They are not strong. Okay? 
They are not the glory of Israel. Right? They are in a, in a very desperate uh, place. And in the midst of their frustrations, they've begun to question God's goodness. They're questioning his love. And they're even questioning his ability to keep his promises or to keep his covenant with them. But to me, the crazy thing is this, they actually said it out loud. <laughs> now, sometimes we might think something, but we don't speak it out loud. Right? In verse 2, God says, I have loved you. Right? God's statement of love to the nation of Israel. And their response to God is, God, in what way have you loved us? I don't believe you. God says, I love you. And they turn, look him in the face, and they say, in what way have you loved us? Because we're not seeing it. Right? All we see is the miserable conditions that we're living in. You don't love us. Okay? You're not doing anything about it. You don't care. Quite an interesting way to start the book of the Bible, right? God say, I love you. And then the God's people turn around and say, no, you don't. I don't believe you. I don't really think you do. And that's just the first of seven different questions that God's people ask of God in the book of Malachi. This is what's interesting. God's people are fighting with God. They're saying, God, you say this, but this is what we think. God, you tell me this, but I don't believe it. God, you're assuring me that you're leading us, but we're lost. God, you say that we are to worship you, but we don't know how. Over and over again. The people are throwing it back at God, saying, God, we don't trust you. We don't believe you. You've got to show it to us. You've got to prove it. Kind of a stubborn people, right? Hmm. Do we ever do that? I don't know. <laughs> Each one of these questions, the nation of Israel is going to, throw at Malik, going to throw back at God. Are questions concerning discouragement, doubts, and ultimately sinfulness. But before we get any more of these questions, and before we look at any more of God's relationship to Israel, how he responds to those questions, I do think it's incredibly significant that God first assures his people of his love. Because none of the answers to any of the other questions are going to matter if they don't see the love of God. And guys, the same thing is true for you and me. If I am not convinced that God cares for me, that God wants what's best for me, and that he truly loves me, nothing else that I read from the Bible is even going to matter. I have to be convinced that God cares, that he loves me. And that's the, the, really the main point for today. God loves people. <laughs> I think this is the simplest point that I've ever had in a sermon. This is my one-point outline today. That's it. If you can remember that one, you remembered my sermon. God loves people. It's so simple that even a three-year-old could grasp that, right? We've got a few little ones in the back. Walter, God loves people. What does God love, Walter? Walter? What does he love? People. I heard it. God loves people. Yeah. And yet, sometimes a simple point like that, we can really get hung up with it. <laughs> Nation of Israel did. They told God, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think you love us. Now, don't answer out loud, but how often have you wondered or thought that yourself? Be honest. How often has the thought crossed your mind, I don't know that God actually loves me. I don't know that he really does care. I don't know if he's who he says he is. I don't know if he can be trusted. Perhaps in the midst of struggle, in the midst of trial or tragedy, you think to yourself, or perhaps you even verbalize it to God, God, you, you really don't care. You said you did, but I don't believe you. The situation is this. Because of our own weaknesses, and let's just be honest, our own sinfulness as well, when we face struggles, when we face difficulty, when we face tragedy, and then add to it perhaps unmet expectations, that's often enough to cause us to question God's intentions and God's promises toward us. All it takes is a little trial, a little adversity, unmet expectations that we have placed upon God. God, if you loved me, you would do X, Y, or Z, but you didn't do it. Now I'm in a bad spot, therefore you don't love me. Right? 
That's enough. That's enough. If we're honest, to cause us to say, God, I don't know. It's not what God wants. But again, because of our own weaknesses and because of our own sinfulnesses, sinfulnesses, that's not a word, (laughs) our own sinfulness, that's where we go. But God doesn't want it to be that way. Does he still care? Even if I say, God, I don't think you do. God, I doubt, I question your love for me. Does he still love you? Does he still care for you? Absolutely. Is he still capable of accomplishing what he promised? Even if you don't see it right now? Absolutely. Why is he taking so long? He's God, and he knows what is best. Now, these are normal human reactions. They're normal reactions to extreme circumstances. They're normal reactions to difficulties. And it's not the way that God wants for us to react, but it is normal. And when you do, you can know that you're not alone. So if you're here this morning and you have found yourselves at times wrestling with God, maybe even today, maybe this week, maybe this last month, maybe this whole last year, you've just been wrestling with God. God, are you really there? Do you really care? Do you really love me? Know that you are not alone in this. This is human. It's not what God wants. He doesn't want you to stay there. He doesn't want you to live there. But he wants to teach you through this moment, lift you up, and place you back in that place where you feel that relationship, you know that relationship, and by faith, you are following him. God does still care. He does love you. And it's in these seasons, in those unpleasant and trying times, that those can be the greatest times of God's gracious refining of our faith. It's not through the ease of life that we grow in faith. It's through the struggles and the difficulties. And any of you who have faced some extreme struggles, I know you'd say the same, because I've heard many of your testimonies. It's through the hardest things of life that we grow the most. It's not when everything's easy. It's when things are hard. I think we've seen an amazing illustration of that even this past week with with dear friends of our church, the Hoppers family, the loss of their house to fire early Monday morning. Talking to both Trisha and Mike this past week, Man, it's clearly evident that God is once again strengthening their faith. Man, what a hard way to do it. I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. But to hear their testimony and to hear them speak the words that, yeah, it's hard to lose the memories, it's hard to lose these things, but at the end of the day, they're just things. We've got our family, we've got one another, God is seeing us through, and them even being able to speak truth into the lives of their friends and family members who are non-believers, how can you go through this? This must be terrible. And they're like, It's okay. This is what God has for us. Man, it's a testimony of God's faithfulness. But it's only happening happening because of that trial. Again, man, what a difficult lesson. But it's not all about us. It's about what God is doing in the entirety of the world, oftentimes in the lives of someone else, through what we might have to go through, even through difficulty and tragedy. And this tragedy, the tragedy of them losing their house, It's not going to be wasted. It's sure going to hurt, but it is not going to be wasted. Again, family safe, healthy, but they are growing in the Lord, and God's glory is being shown to so many people around them, even amidst that tragedy. It's simply the way that God works. And Israel had to learn that again. They've been given a lot of times, a lot of lessons, a lot of opportunities to learn that. And so have we. But until we learn it, we're going to keep going through it. He's going to keep refining us. He's going to keep allowing things so that our faith will be upon him and so that his glory will be reflected to the world. Man, some tough stuff. That's the way God works. So as God responds to Israel's question, in what way have you loved us? God reminded them of his covenant with them. Malachi speaks the words of the Lord and he says, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, those same words are quoted in Romans chapter 9 as well, so you might recognize those maybe more, more so from Romans than from the book of Malachi. Okay? Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And what God is saying is that Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel, so when we're talking about the nation of Israel, we're referencing back to Jacob, okay? that he was chosen by God for this special blessing. I mean, it started with the covenant with Abraham and passed down through the lineage, but you've got Jacob and Esau, two brothers. 
And so if you're going to have a family line and you're going to eventually have a Messiah that comes from a certain family and you've got two brothers, it's going to come from one or the other, right? It's got to. And God says, I choose Jacob. So, and he chose Jacob, um, the nation of Israel, to be his people, not the Edomites, which were the people of Esau. And when God says he hated Esau, it isn't so much in the sense of cursing him. It isn't so much in the sense of striking out against him. In fact, in one sense, it could be said that Esau was a blessed man. He was not the one that was chosen by God to bring about the Messiah. He was not the one through which the covenant would come. But if you look at Genesis chapter 33 and verse 9, you're going to see that Esau had been blessed uh, in many things. If you read all of chapter 36 of the book of Genesis, you see that, that, that Esau is blessed in many, many ways by God. And so when you see that word hate, okay, it's, again, it's not a cursing, it's not striking out against him, it's that he is not the one who was chosen by God. And yet when God chose Jacob, leaving Jacob unchosen in regard to receiving this blessing is as if it were hatred, because you didn't pick me. Jacob and Esau were brothers. God chose to bring about his people through the line of Jacob, not Esau. But here's the problem from the perspective of the Israelites. There's still this clash between Jacob and Esau. While they are being ravaged by the Assyrian and Babylonian empires, the Israelites, Edom, they're still having their struggles, but they're remaining fairly intact. Okay? They have not faced the levels of severity that the nation of Israel or Jacob has faced. And so Esau's people are like, eh, life's not terrible. Israel is like, life's horrible. <laughs> this is bad. And so now they are struggling to rebuild, the Israelites, and Edom appears to be kind of prosperous. Okay? Maybe not the greatest nation, but they appear to be somewhat prosperous. However, God declared that his hand of blessing and his promised presence were only with Israel where his judgment was against Edom, even if it didn't look that way. Even if it didn't look that way. And in this, I think there's a really practical point that we need to see. Wealth, prosperity, are not always signs of God's blessing. And difficulty is not always a sign of his judgment. <laughs> Let's not be confused. The world would say that that is true. The world would say that wealth and prosperity are signs of success and blessing. While difficulty are signs of judgment. It's not true. With God, that is absolutely not true. God is a loving father. And he chastens the children that he cares for. It's clearly seen in Hebrews 12, 6 through 7. Right? God cares for his kids. If you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, he cares for you. But that also means because he cares, he will course correct. He will do that which is necessary to get us back on track. And sometimes the most loving thing he can do is to be tough on me. To be tough so that we will follow his way. Instead of stubborn and rebelling against it. I don't like to hear that. And I don't like to be the one to have to say that. But those are the words of Malachi. Sometimes God's going to have to be tough on you, Israel. Because you're not listening Sometimes I have to shout that back to myself. Sometimes God might have to be tough on me because I am not listening to God. When we keep making the same dumb choices over and over again, God at some point should be saying, if he cares for us, right, enough's enough. I'm going to bring correction. And he does because he cares. And through this process of correction, the eyes of Israel are going to be opened to see the greatness of God. Through this process of correction, they're going to see things in a better light. They're going to understand things with a better perspective. And God continually manifests his love to his people. We're going to see that in the book of Malachi. And I'm talking today, though, about Christians just as much as I'm talking about the nation of Israel during the time of Malachi. The only fitting response to the love of God is to love in return. When God says, I have loved you, our response should be reciprocal in that, yes, I believe that, and God, I too love you. I will serve you. To reciprocate that love to God 
so that all the rest of the world will see it is the greatest thing that we can do. Do we understand that? That when God says, I love you, through his word, through his spirit, through his comfort in times of difficulty, instead of blaming God for the situation we find ourselves in, to say, God, yes, I received that. I thank you for it. You are good. You are gracious. You're kind. And allowing the rest of the world to see that, guys, that's what this is all about, what the rest of the world needs to see. If you're a Christian, you are called to love God because he has shown the greatest of love to you, the love of Jesus. Okay. Point three, three simple words. The whole sermon point. God loves people. You can replace people with you. God loves you. In 1 John 4, 19, John writes, we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. It's pretty simple. How can I love God? Why do I love God? Because he loved me. And the reciprocal response is that I love him. It's true then, and it's true today. God takes the first step. He shows us love. He shows us grace. He shows us mercy and kindness and all of those things that really are undeserved and even ill-deserved in our lives. And yet, he still shows them to us, giving them to us anyway. How could we not love him back, even when life gets hard? How could I not love him back? That's the lesson that Israel needed to learn, and perhaps the lesson that, that God's teaching you today as well. Perhaps that's what we all need to see. God's love is limitless. Even when it's tough love, he still shows it to us. God has not turned his back on you. He has not left you. He cares for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe it? If you're struggling with believing it, if you're like the nation of Israel and you're in that place and you're questioning, doubting it, let me just say that God is ready to answer all of your questions, to give you satisfaction to all of your doubts as long as you are ready to be honest with him. Even if that means calling out to him and saying, God, I don't see in your love. Be honest about that. Say, God, I'm not seeing it. I'm not feeling it. God, help me. Be honest with where you are. Okay, don't cover it up with religiosity. Don't cover it up with trying to be a good person. Don't cover it up with trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Be honest with God. Allow God to reveal truth. Respond to that truth. And allow God to lift you back up. And that first truth that we've got to see is that he simply cares for you. He cares for me. Loving that which God loves, he loves people. First and foremost, he loves you. And as we understand that he loves us, he says, now go show that love to other people. The rest of the world needs to see it. Because they certainly don't understand it. This world today does not understand the love of God. But they need to. But they can't see it unless you first accept it. Unless you're first living it and living in it. God's never going to let you down. He never walks away. He never abandons his children. He walks with you. He guides you. And he leads you for his name's sake. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, you are good to us. You've told us that over and over again. And even as we look at the beginning of the book of, of Malachi, Lord, you said it right there. I have loved you. And God, you say that to your children today, just as you have said it to your chosen people over 2,000 years ago. And God, I pray that you would help us to see that that love, God, it, it forgives sin. That, that love, it removes grief. It removes heartache and pain. It gives direction. It gives purpose in life. It lifts up the fallen. God, it helps us to see clearly. And it helps us even in the midst of tragedy. Lord, I know that there are people here and there are people watching at home, God, and, and they're struggling with a true understanding of your love. God, I, and I know that because it's natural. I know that because we are weak and we are, we are sinful, myself included. And there are simply times, God, where I fail to acknowledge 
reality and truth. And I fail to see you as you really are. And Lord, because I know it in my life, I know it's happening in the lives of others, but God, I pray that your spirit today would lift up the brokenhearted. God, that you would point to truth. And God, that you would turn that heart that is far from you back to you. Lord, I pray that you would do what only you can. And God, I pray that as we study through this book of the Bible, this Old Testament book that concludes, that concludes the final chapter of the Old Testament, that you would help us to see, God, that you do ultimately love us and that you want us to love others as well. Lord, I'm thankful for what you're doing in our midst. I'm thankful for what you're doing in my life, that you haven't given up on me, that you are refining me, and that you are changing me to be more conformed to the image of Jesus. Lord, I pray that I would live that out well. And God, that I would seek you and that I would honor you in word as well as in action. Lord, I pray, especially again today, Lord, for those who are hurting, Lord, comfort them, but then also show them your love and that that love can be lived out and can be reflected back to you, can be reciprocated through obedience. Lord, I'm thankful for what you're doing in our midst and give this time to you today. In Jesus' name.